What about Dickie Mountbatten? Um, because again, you, know, you allege, or are we beyond the word allege, I think, uh, because you found this in an FBI file, that he was a rampant offender and that his victims um, included children. Yes, there's quite a lot of evidence that uh, Matt Batten was a paedophile, not just the material in the FBI files, which went back to 1943, but testimony from a whole series of people, including his chauffeur during the uh, Second World War, who, who claims to have uh, uh, taken young children to him or f from him. Um, there is uh, evidence from the two boys I interviewed who were abused at Classic Born in August 1977. A third victim has come forward called Arthur Smith, who lives in Australia, and he's got a case going through the High Court in Belfast at the moment for some sort of compensation. Not against the Mountbatten family, but against um, uh, Kinkora, the boys' home in which he was kept, where a lot of these boys were trafficked. Um, and there's quite a lot of other people have come forward with stories about Mountbatten's either bisexuality or his paedophilia. We have to stress that there is separate things. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think there's plenty of evidence there. And the fact that, you know, Mountbatten is a subject where records are destroyed, people won't talk, I think is quite revealing. Um, I've got a documentary which should be out soon where we have testimony from all sorts of people. For example, uh, a man who's, who was very close to a woman who ran a brothel in Pimlico and Matt Batten would come there and his big thing was getting dressed up in baby clothes. Oh. Um, there's uh, stories um, from journalists uh, of a, 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 a prostitute in Soho who used to beat him. Uh, so there are lots of different stories uh, from, I think, pretty reputable sources. Often they've come to me w w by chance. So, for example, the brothel in Pimlico, someone wanted to offer me a, bi a biography of this woman, uh, not knowing about my Mountbatten interest, uh, to be wearing my agent's hat. Um, and this was just literally a, a throwaway remark on one page. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence that's beginning to come to light. Uh, on him. I mean, clearly most of the people who would know anything are dead now. Mm. But, you know, diaries were kept, letters were sometimes written. Uh, there are documents around. Uh, and so I think there will be more and more of this emerging. And I think Arthur Smith is a very crucial um, witness because he's prepared to go on camera. Uh, he's given interviews. He's p pursuing a court case. Other victims have tried court cases, but they've basically been found, they've basically been uh, run out of money to conduct them, or the tribunals have said they it's out of time. Um, so people have tried to shut down the case, and and Arthur Smith seems to be going through. So I think will will Matt Batten's reputation will be reassessed in the next few years. Wow, wow, that's really interesting to see uh, to to sort of be there for history being changed in that sense. Well, you know, here was a man who was the great hero, hero of our time, I think it was one of the books. You know, he did a 12-part series on the BBC, mentor to Charles. Mm. He mentored... What was his relation to Charles? The fam familial? Well, uh, 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 <clears throat> Philip, um, uh, Prince Philip was uh, Dickie's nephew and okay. he helped bring him up. D uh, Philip took uh, his name, Mount Batten, when he was naturalized. It was Mount Batten who encouraged the romance with the Queen. It was Mount Batten who got him into the Navy. Philip might well have joined the, the Air Force and would probably have been killed in the Second World War. So the history would be very, very different. You know, mm -hmm. the Queen would have married someone else. Uh, so very, very close. He was very, he was the, the best man to Edward VIII, very close to George VI, early mentor to the Queen when she came to power. Uh, and so his influence has gone down through four generations, last great grandchild of Queen Victoria. So he's very much part of the insider royal family. Do you think uh, it's possible he might have abused any of the young royals? Well, I mean, people have suggested that. I found no evidence to support that, and I think it's very unlikely. Mm. So only, I'm only thinking because, again, that's secular. Uh, uh, what you know, when offender, perpetrator, then victim, and that line. Well, I think we certainly found one of the things I did find was a man called Frederick Long, who uh, had married Mountbatten and had been his tutor when he was a teenager. When he was at uh, Dartmouth, he had to go off and be personally tutored because he'd been ill. Uh, and what was fascinating is that in the miscellaneous correspondence for, I think, 1916, there are love letters from Frederick Lawrence L Long to Dickey. Uh, and Long never married. He was, became a Church of England vicar. Um, and 
this is the only correspondence in you know 54,000 files at Southampton which relate to Long. And yet Long must have remained in touch with Long because he was the minister who married him. So they must have been close. So I think there is some evidence that Long abused Mountbatten and this is where it all began. Wow. Yeah, that often, it seems to be that way. It's a pattern it? of behavior. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. And then Mel Basson would use brandy and lemonade, apparently, to seduce, or to bring out children in Kinkora. Well, that's that was what was interesting. That that was the story that Norman Neild, the, the, the Second World War chauffeur, told. Uh, and that was only appeared in a paper in New Zealand. Uh, and that came out only because Norman Neal said, I've just read Spycatcher, it's got lots of attention, I've got an even bigger story. But the Norman Neal story was suppressed here. Robert Maxwell was sent it, one of the journalists, uh, and the journalist who wrote the piece is still alive in Australia. Uh, and it, I hope will appear in this program. Wow. Um, but it, the whole story was suppressed here. And that's the problem. So many of these stories just don't, still don't get seen here. Uh, and, you know, it's easier now with social media and we have a a much more pluralistic press, so uh, it's more likely. But um, brandy and, 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 and uh, lemonade was, was actually one of his favorite drinks. It comes out in some of the search and uh, it's come out in other episodes. And I think people have come to that separately. It's not a, a something that they would read up easily. Mm. What is an MI5 blackmail honey trap? Well, um, this is the reference to Kinkora. Um, a honey trap is basically when uh, generally intelligence service uh, runs, for example, a brothel like uh, Kitty, uh, Salon Kitty in, in, in by the Germans, the Nazis. And they use basically the, the, the pillow talk from the people there um, to, to get secrets. So um, the idea was that, uh, certainly in Salon Kitty, that people would, would say revealing things and that would be passed back by the, the, the prostitutes. Kinkora was a boy's home and it was, um, uh, the boys clearly had no family. There was no one really taking, keeping an eye on them. The man who ran Kinkora, William McGrath, was a, 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 a involved with them, one of the, the, the loyalist organizations and also a file himself. And there's some evidence that he was trafficking boys from Kinkora, because of course, no one knew what was going on with them, to uh, both rich um, Anglo-Irish, it was called the Anglo-Irish Vice Ring, uh, a, a group of people centered on country houses across Ireland. Um, but also, and, and the authorities, so MI5, who were the intelligence organization in Northern Ireland knew this, and they allowed this to happen because, of course, this gave them a chance to blackmail people mm. uh, to work for them. So there were quite a lot of loyalist terrorists, for example, who were involved in this, who were paedophiles. I mean, even suggestion that Jerry Adams, I think's brother, was convicted as a paedophile. So it was on both sides. And so they used these poor boys as pawns, really, to, to get uh, these people by the short and curlies and then get them to cooperate. Why is it that the Irish government is holding stuff back and not letting you get the full information? Because wouldn't they want this to get to light? No, they don't. They don't want, I mean, there was probably quite a lot of, um, well, a lot of this stuff is illegal. Um, uh, people turning a blind eye to it. Uh, you know, in Northern Ireland, memories are long. Um, there might well be um, repercussions to people uh, as stuff came out. We, you know, we always keep quiet about the informants, for example. So, um, no, I think it's a very sensitive subject, so I can understand why they want to shut it down. But, you know, we have to think that also there are victims here. And these were young yeah. boys who really had no one to look out for them. Uh, and they were just pawns in a, in, a, in a bigger game. What does it mean to you as a writer to get this story validated and more, more for consensus and, and more known? Well, I think these boys deserve justice. I, just, I think the truth needs to come out. It's It's... I'm always uh, um, uh, pleased when other historians find information that I haven't got. So it's not just me banging this drum. Uh, the television programs, you know, now have the courage to do it. I've been talking to the broadcaster for at least five years about this program, and they've been very nervous about doing it. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, I, I feel that the, 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 there's been a recalibration and it's people are more prepared to accept these things and to broadcast them, uh, you know, to suggest that the, the, the Prince Philip's uncle was a...
far, I think would have been a difficult program mm -hmm. even a few years ago. But now they're both dead. I think it's probably a bit easier. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I do the best I can with the books, you know, research them heavily. And I, to find that they're, they're validated by other people's research is always very um, encouraging. It means I'm not out on a limb because it can be quite lonely sometimes um, saying some of the things I'm saying.